evening and welcome to tonight's forum featuring candidates for the Washington State Legislature, 40th District, Position 1, and 42nd District, Positions 1 and 2. I'm Jill Bernstein, and along with Annette Holcomb, we have the pleasure and the privilege of being the co-presidents of the League of Women Voters of Bellingham and Whatcom County. Tonight, we're going to ask you to do two things. Would you please turn your cell phones off now, check and make sure they're really off, and stand with me for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America, to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. This voter forum is presented by the League of Women Voters of Bellingham and Whatcom County and the City of Bellingham. The City has graciously provided the facilities and the forum is being televised live on BTV 10. The broadcast will be repeated between now and the election on BTV 10 and the city's website and on low-powered radio stations KAVZ and KMRE. We thank the City of Bellingham and our media partner, the Bellingham Herald, for their generous support in making tonight a po possible and being able to present this forum to you. The forum is the property of the League of Women Voters of Bellingham, Whatcom County, and the City of Bellingham, and may not be used in any manner without specific written permission from both parties. When I ask you to turn off your cell phones, that includes the video function. Thank you. I wanted to tell you that the League of Women Voters is a nonpartisan organization founded in 1920 and today has over 800 affiliates across the country. Membership to the League is open to men and women of all ages. The League of Women Voters encourages informed and active participation in government. We work to increase understanding of major public policy issues, and we work to influence public policy through education and advocacy. It is really important that you understand that the League does not support or oppose candidates, and we do not endorse or support political parties. It is our pleasure to present today's forum to help you to become more knowledgeable about the issues and candidates that will appear on your ballot this November. We welcome men and women to join us and welcome your participation in League voter information activities such as these forums. If you are not currently a member, I invite you to pick up membership information at the table outside of this room or go to our website and simply click on the Join Us button. Uh, this evening, no campaign literature may be distributed within the building. Uh, it is part of the regulations under which this building is operated by the City of Bellingham. Some of the campaigns may offer you literature outside of the building, and that is perfectly proper. For this evening, members of the League of Women Voters um, Forum Committee have written a few questions which the candidates have not seen. These questions will be asked to the candidates, but we are eager to ask as many of your questions on as many different issues as possible in the time available. Now, if you have questions for the candidates, please write them on the index cards provided and pass your cards to an usher. Ushers, would you raise your hand so everyone can see you? There you go. Um, they're walking around with the baskets. Um, please, members of the audience, raise your hands if you need another card. Please write or print your questions legibly on the cards with one question per card. Note on the card which race or set of candidates you're directing that question to, or you can say that they're for all of the races or all of the candidates if that's the way that you would like your question to be um, asked. Now, the questions will be screened for legibility, for clarity, and for duplication by members of the league seated at the table. It's Joe Collins, Jane Freudenberger, and John Turnbaugh who are doing uh, doing the duty this evening, and we are grateful to them and all of our volunteers tonight uh, in helping this run smoothly. And now it is my pleasure and my privilege to introduce our moderator for this evening, Tanya Baumgart. Tanya? Thank you, Jill. And good evening, everyone. We are now at the last of the 2014 League Series of Candidate Forums. Our forum tonight covers the candidates running for Washington State House of Representatives in the 40th and 42nd districts. All House members are elected for two years during even-numbered years. They start serving 
the second Monday of January and have an annual salary of $42,700. We are starting with the 40th District, position one. Candidates, you can come forward to the podium. May I introduce candidates Christine Litton and Daniel R. Miller. The candidate for the 40th District, position two, is the incumbent, Jeff Morris. Now before we begin, the rules for the forum are, candidates will have one minute for their opening statements to respond to questions and for their closing statements. Riley Abel will be tracking time, Riley, and Margaret Wall will be flashing a yellow sign when there are 15 seconds left to respond, and a red sign to signal stop. The if the candidate continues, a bell will be rung. That means quit talking, <laughs> finito, we're getting the hook. We ask that the candidates are respectful of the time allotted due to the limited amount of time that we have. An important goal of the League is to promote civil discussion. To that end, we also, we also ask that those in the audience be respectful and refrain from comments, as well as hold their applause until the conclusion of each segment of the forum. Questions from the audience should be addressed to both candidates. Questions are screened, as you were told by Jill, by these league, lovely League members here, and they're screening for legibility, clarity, and duplication. To start us off, candidates rolled dice, and the high roller had the choice of going first with their opening statement, or having the last closing statement. After the start, we will rotate which candidate responds to questions first. The winner of the dice roll was Ms. Litton, and her choice was to do the last closing statement. So that means, Mr. Miller, you will have one minute to give your opening statement, please. Oh, hi, I'm Daniel Miller. I'm running for state legislature, 40th district, position one here in Washington State. But just last week we were here, it's kind of nostalgic, we were here for another forum. Um, I'm concerned about property rights. I'm concerned about ferries. I'm concerned about water rights. I'm concerned about working for jobs and a good local economy. I'm concerned about smart spending, smarter spending, and educational policy. It was just last night I was watching the governor's debate um, on C-SPAN in Rhode Island. And the mayor of Cranston keeps raising taxes. Well, the treasurer um, in Rhode Island is, um, wants to lower taxes, rebuild Rhode Island, and um, try to make things easy on, on people. That's what we need to do in Washington State. Keep taxes low. Keep a robust economy. And we certainly shouldn't impose a gas tax on the good people of Washington State, which our governor, Jay Inslee, wishes to do in um, 2015. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Litton, your opening statement? Yeah, thank you very much. And thanks for all the volunteers and League of Women Voters for hosting this tonight. I'm Christine Litton, and I'm your state representative for the 40th District. It's been an honor to represent you the last four years. Um, while the challenges facing our state and communities have been great, I believe that working together, we can solve problems facing us and build for the future. I am actually um, an Anacortes resident, just a little bit of my background. My husband, Mike, and I raised two boys there, and we have one um, gainfully employed in Houston and one going to college here in Washington State. I serve on four committees in Olympia. Um, I am vice chair of the Ag and Natural Resources Committee. I serve on the Education Committee, and I serve on both sides of the ledger. I serve on the Finance side, and I serve on the Spending side, the Appropriations Committee. And I'm also Deputy Majority Floor Leader for the House Democrats. I look forward to having a great discussion tonight and the, the opportunities that we have to, to let everyone know what our positions are. Thank you. Thank you. The first question. The State Office of Financial Management projects revenue growth for 2015 through 17 to fall far short of what will be needed to cover state services. What are your specific proposals to meet the additional needs of K through 12 basic education? Uh, candidate Litton, we'll start with you. 
Actually, yeah, thank you very much. So we do have um, an, in, in the, an enormous problem that we have to solve when we head back in, in January, and many of you heard about the McCleary decision that we have to come up for um, uh, about $4 billion over the next four years to help pay for a basic education. We were, are going to have to look at both sides of the ledger. The first place I want to look is on the finance side. I want to look at our tax loopholes. We have over 650 um, tax loopholes in our state. Some of them are a benefit to the citizens of our state, but many of them are outdated. It's time for us to really go back and look at the priorities of government and look at those preferences and prioritize education over many of those tax preferences, and that's the first place that I will look for that. I think that it will be a combination of, um, of many things. It will not be one answer that's going to solve our problem in Olympia. And I look forward to looking at all those um, options and, um, and having that discussion with everyone. Thank you. Mr. Miller? Uh, um, could you read the question again? Oh, absolutely. The State Office of Financial Management projects revenue growth for 2015 through 17 will fall far short of what will be needed to cover state services. What are your specific proposals to meet the additional needs of K through 12 basic education? Well, first let me say the investments in Washington State are strong. And I believe that the investments in Washington State will carry, will be strong through 2015. I want to look, work on a bipartisan effort, a bipartisan approach to come up with the funding needed um, to, you know, for spending. The court had said under the McCleary decision that we need to come up with this money, and I'm fairly confident in 2015, on a bipartisan basis, we will definitely come up with the money and solve this issue. Thank you. Thank you. Next question. The legislature did not pass the transportation package last session. What are your proposals for funding repairs to our aging and deteriorating transportation infrastructure? And uh, Mr. Miller, we'll start with you for this one. Well, that brings me to, we need to cut some waste in government. Um, apparently, um, th we do need to fund certain transportation projects. That's no secret. But there's also a lot of waste in the Department of Transportation. That's also no secret. It's just um, this year, the ferry they want to impose a ferry reservation system on the people of San Juan County. They don't want it. They don't need it. They spent $2 million already on this boondoggle, and sure enough, they're going to spend $2 million more before it's all over, and a lot of people feel oppressed. They feel their flexibility and their freedom is being taken away. So there are problems with the, the Department of Transportation, and sure enough, we'll work on a bipartisan approach to come up with the needed money for real important um, transportation pro uh, projects. Thank you. Thank you. Candidate Litton? Yeah, so we actually tried to pass a transportation revenue package last year and it got hung up in the Senate and, um, you know, the Senate just really could not come up with a compromise and work with us on a solution for it. I believe that we need to move forward then with a transportation revenue package that really is more about preservation and maintenance. And maybe it's not 11.5 cents that the Senate was proposing, but maybe it's a scaled back version. For number, we have to move forward with maintaining our infrastructure in our state. Our economy is tied to it, and we have to have, um, I, I'll talk a lot about the, the opportunity of our infrastructure, and whether that's education or transportation, we have to be able to, to make these decisions to make um, Washington State economically prosperous. Thank you. The next question, do you believe that artificial entities like corporations should have the same rights as people? Candidate Linton. No. <laughs> Candidate Miller. Um, <laughs> do they, should they have the same rights as people? Well, corporations are people. I mean, because people work in corporations, but c corporations themselves should not have the same rights as people, no. Thank you. Sorry, you guys are ahead of me. <laughs> and I'd like to take just a brief moment to ask the audience to, you know, not applaud or, or make little comments, please. Just a reminder. All right. The current vacancy rate in Whatcom County for one-bedroom rental units was just 0.5% and only 1.2% for two-bedroom units. 
Do you believe there is a role for the legislature in addressing the need for affordable, safe, and healthy housing? And please explain your view. Candidate Miller, we will start with you. Well, certainly there's a place. You don't want, you know, slumlords um, renting something really high to, you know, to a family. So um, there is a place. But um, I'm not in the legislature yet. I'm willing to learn once I get there. I want to look at different options and work on a bipartisan manner on, on this issue as well. Thank you. Thank you. Candidate Linton? Yeah, there actually is a place. It's in our capital budget. And we help fund um, low-income housing across our state. Last week, I was up with um, Catholic Community Services and looking at some of the work that they're doing. And I want to help them um, move forward with some low-income housing here in Bellingham and across our district. We absolutely have to have that. If we have people who don't or are hungry and don't have roofs over their head, they have no opportunity for success of going out and leading a productive of life. They will continue to be more dependent. So I absolutely do, um, will support that and work um, to provide low-income housing. Thank you. What do you think about the minimum wage proposals? Candidate Litton, please. Right. I do support raise, raising the minimum wage. I believe that anyone that works full-time should have the opportunity and the pleasure of providing for their families. With regard to what exact amount that will be, I'm not really sure. We had a proposal last year. It was $12 in some sense. I don't remember exactly. But what I don't support is each local community coming up with their own minimum wage and having the disparity across our state. I think it has to be a statewide approach. I know they're also looking at it at the federal level, and I strongly support that. Thank you. Candidate Miller, please. Um, can you sure. say the question again? <laughs> sure. What do you think about the minimum wage proposals? Well, there's um, multiple minimum wage proposals. I, I don't think it's good if Seattle has one minimum wage and Tacoma has another minimum wage and Centralia has another minimum wage. Um, minimum wages need to be uniform. Um, certainly. People, when they get up, go to work every morning, go out in the cold, they deserve a good wage. And certainly, um, there needs to be a minimum wage. But I don't know that the minimum wage needs to be $15 an hour. But secondly, I don't think um, one size, I mean, you've got to have, in that case, you have to have actually one size fits all. You've got to have a statewide approach. You can't have city by city. That just won't work. Um, you know, a lot of businesses will move out of one area to go to another area. So. That's it. Thank you. Thank you. What is your position on coal and oil train safety? And candidate Miller, we'll start with you. Well, I, I, later on I'll talk about you know the gas tax and stuff because it's okay. Th this whole issue has to do with electricity, power companies, um, which will be discussed in the legislature. But on. Specifically on the coal trains, I would like to have safety um, inspections of the coal trains, um, maybe monthly, maybe you know bi-monthly, but we definitely need um, safety inspections on the coal trains. Thank you. Candidate Linton? Yeah, so oil and um, coal transportation safety, I would like to propose that, um, you know, we work with the refineries, we work with our communities, but um, barrel of oil um, transported on the water is taxed. I believe that the oil also should be taxed by rail and that money be used for um, for safety training, for safety equipment. I've been talking to the firefighters in the 40th district to see what their needs are. And we have astronomical needs um, to address and for them to be prepared, emergency preparedness. So um, I think that's all I have to say. Thank you. Uh, will you honor, protect teacher, school employee, and public employee present pension plans, and we will start with candidate Litton, please. 
Yeah, so our pension plan, I do support um, our, the promises that we have made to our state employees. We actually re got a report back from the state actuary that we were behind um, due to the boomers living a little bit longer than anticipated. So um, we have to come up with a $338 million to make our, our pension system whole. Those are our promises we've made. And I actually want to call out my, my father-in-law who's here tonight um, is one of those gray-haired boomers and I need to keep his pension system whole or I'll hear about it at the Thanksgiving meal. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Candidate Miller, please. Yeah. Sorry about this, but if you could just repeat that question, that'd be fantastic. Oh, sure. Just one moment, please. Okay. Will you honor, protect teacher, school employee, and public employee present pension plans? So, I mean, sure. They need to um, be protected. But if you look at the investments, um, you know, there's, it, it's a huge subject in itself. I, I've got a list of all the investments of the pension, you know, individual pensions and, and the different investments that these pensions are invested in. But yes, I will protect the um, teachers. My sister's a teacher up there in Ferndale, and she loves teaching, and she plans to teach the rest of her life. Well, not the rest of her life, but <laughs> until she retires. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Uh, what stand do you take regarding initiative I-594 and why? Um, we will start with candidate Miller, please. So 594 is the one that doesn't um, talk about God. Hey, can you explain which, which is which right now? Because I'm kind of tired. I, I do not support the universal background check. Um, we already have safeguards that need to be um, enforced, so I do not support the universal background check. Thank you. Candidate Linton? Yeah, I support I-594. It's uh, common sense, universal background checks. This isn't trying to take guns away from anyone. I am a strong Second Amendment supporter, but this is just common sense legislation, and I support it. Thank you. The next question, what is your view of the proper role of government and how will it guide your decisions as an elected official? If you are elected in November, how would you apply that philosophy to specific issues before the legislature? And we'll start with candidate Linton. Yeah, the, so is government too big or too small? I believe that government, when it was well run, serves its citizens and the people of the state that we help build um, that infrastructure of opportunity with a great education system from early learning through higher ed. I believe that government helps us keep our community safe. It helps us keep our environment healthy. And um, I think that, that the role that it plays, um, I don't agree with the notion that government is bad and that we need to continuously cut any road. I think government is the great equalizer of all of us and brings fairness to every single person in our state. Thank you. Candidate Miller? Sorry about this. Can you read the, repeat the question? Oh, sure. What is your view of the proper role of government and how will it guide your decisions as an elected official? If you are elected in November, how would you apply that philosophy to specific issues before the legislature? Well, I think one thing that government should do, proper role of government, is to um, not try to overburden the citizens of that state with taxes that are too high. Just for instance, the um, carbon tax, the gas tax, it, it, when it's all said and done, it'll raise the gas tax by um, perhaps $1.40 a gallon. And um, plus there's other schemes they want to maybe charge per mile. So. Gov one role of government is to work and maintain freedom and liberty and not overburden its citizens with taxes that are too high, regulations that are too high, big. You know, a lot of people are concerned about property rights. Property rights are slipping away in Skagit County with the water rights and nationally. And so government also, you know, can also should provide services like Meals on Wheels for seniors. My grandfather, he used Meals on Wheels for several years. So government has many functions, from Mills on Wheels to protecting freedom and liberty of its citizens and not making it overburdened. Thank you. Thank you. The next question. What is your position on promoting paid leave for Washington State workers? And this time we'll start with you, Candidate Miller. Paid leave for? 
Washington State workers. Um, <laughs> now, I'm not really familiar with that right now, paid leave. I haven't really studied that too much, but I'm willing to learn, like several other people that are running for the state legislature or the Senate, you know, have expressed interest in learning, and I too express interest in learning on certain subjects and working in a bipartisan manner. Thank you. Thank you. Candidate Linton, please. Yeah, I am going to assume that's talking about paid sick leave, um, maybe take some liberties with it. So I do actually support paid sick leave and supported it in the legislature. I um, particularly, we hear a lot of stories about folks that work in the restaurant business or just are out and about people a lot. I really think they need the opportunity to stay home and get better and, and not spread all those germs, quite frankly, when they're out and about. So I support paid sick leave. Thank you. What is your position on a paycheck fairness law to ensure women get equal pay for equal work? And we're going to start with candidate Litton this time. I absolutely support that. I think that um, we have many um, inequality issues around income, not just with women, um, but um, absolutely support that. I, mean, I too would support that. Women, if they do the same work as men, of course. I mean, it's just simple. Um, they should get paid as much as men. You know, um, I don't think it should be such a big issue. I mean, it's just pretty obvious they should get paid. And um, yeah. Thank you. What are your feelings about the voters supporting 1351, smaller class size? Supporting or not supporting, excuse me, 1351, smaller class size, even though it is an unfunded initiative? And we will start with candidate Miller, please. Well, my teacher, my teacher, my sister is a teacher up there in the Ferndale area. Of course, she would love smaller class sizes. Of course, the students would love smaller class sizes as well because it would, um, you know, give the students more attention. The students could do better. So, in principle, I support smaller class sizes. But right now, we can't really afford it. We've, the court says that we have to come up with money on a bipartisan manner to solve the McClary decision. So that's what we have to do. And maybe down the road, we can have smaller class sizes. But currently, it just won't work. Thank you. Candidate Litton, please. Yeah, I do not support 1351, although it's a, a laudable effort. We made promises to the citizens of the state of Washington when we passed um, comprehensive basic education bills in 29 um, and 10 that would fully fund basic education. I think we need to keep on that course. Um, like I said, we have a significant hole to fill to fulfill that. Part of that McCleary decision, as we talk about full funding basic education, is K-3 enhancement. So we already know that the best bang for our buck, of course, is reducing class size K-3. That's in there. This is an unfunded mandate to the citizens of our state. If we had that extra money, I would rather see it go toward early learning. Um, get kids um, kindergarten ready, and I would also like to see um, us fund um, higher education um, better if we had the money. Thank you. The next question, what ways would you communicate with your constituents if you were elected? And that is for candidate Litton first, please. Yeah, so uh, while we're in session, I send out, try to send out a, a weekly email blast of kind of what's going on in the legislature, where we are. The other thing that I spend the most um, time on, and of course when we're in the legislature, it always seems like that's our job. The biggest part of my job is in the interim, of going out and about and visiting communities, visiting people, seeing what programs there are, and really trying to understand how the economies in our state work, what people want, what their hopes are for the future. So the biggest job I have is during the interim and talking to people, trying to understand what their needs are. I think people need that um, opportunity, um, that time with me. It's not so much of what my opinion is all the time. I need to hear from people. It's more about people communicating with me. So I spend a great deal of time. I'm fortunate that I get to do this full time. So during the interim, um, I am up in Bellingham probably once or twice a week and across my district into the islands, and I will commit to do that. Now, this is kind of a fun question um, <laughs> because um, I'm going to communicate on a variety of ways. One way is I'm going to welcome people down to my office for a donut, cookie, or coffee. 
Um, I'm going to have a coffee area, you know. Um, also, you know, through newsletters, of course, I'm going to have visiting hours in each part of the district as well. So I plan on, you know, um, communicating with my constituents very frequently, but also I want to hear from the constituents, you know, just pick up the phone and call me or shoot out an email and, um, yeah. Thank you. What would you do to support and grow higher education? Candidate Miller, we'll start with you. Well, higher education is important. I went to the University of Washington as well as Evergreen State College, so I support higher education. Um, I just want to work on a bipartisan manner and come up with, um, you know, ways to support higher education. Higher education is important. Of course, just because you have higher education doesn't guarantee a job in today's economy. So I want to also have um, manufacturing jobs come to the 40th district, agriculture jo jobs, construction jobs, which also brings me to a fun little idea of bringing some movie production jobs to the 40th district. Movie production actually would fit in quite cleverly with the 40th district. The landscape here really lends itself to suspense movies, comedy movies, as well as horror movies. <laughs> so, but I support higher education, and I intend to do that in the legislature. Thank you. Candidate Linton? Yeah, so we have had some really significantly difficult years, and we have cut and cut and cut, and higher ed has felt that. Um, I have had um, two boys at the same time in college. My kids were the lucky kids because they had that opportunity to do that. We need to continue expanding our state need grant program. Last year we passed the DREAM Act that allowed all of our kids in our state, you reside in your borders, in our borders, and you can apply for a state need grant. We need to expand the opportunity for every kid in our state to have some form of post-secondary education. Whether you're going to be a welder or you're going to be a brain surgeon, I think it's important to the economies of our state. And we need to find a way in our state to, to reinvest in the future generation and not step around behind away from that this has not been a good long-term strategy in our state the constant cuts to um, many of our programs in our state we're eroding the infrastructure in our state thank you how do you respond to the perception that campaign donors have an expectation of quid pro quo from candidates and we'll start with you candidate Linton Right, so I know that that is the perception out there, and when we are in Olympia, it is incredibly um, intense. Those same um, lobbyists are outside our doors every single second of the day, but you as citizens of the state, when I talk about going out um, in the interim and hearing from people, you're the most important component, and you are the most important person that I look at when I make decisions. I agree that that is a perception. I would love to um, have some form of um, reform with campaign finance to get the big money out of campaigns. But I think don't sit back and complain that you don't have a voice because every single person that calls me or emails me gets a response. In any time that people want to talk, you guys have a lot of power and calling your legislators is the first thing you need to do and ask to talk to them. You don't have to buy them a cup of coffee. Just talk to them. <laughs> Thank you. And Sorry, no laughing. <laughs> <laughs> Candidate Miller, please. And the question was? How do you respond to the perception that campaign donors have an expectation of quid pro, pro quo from candidates? I mean, there's a perception out there, of course. But um, like Candidate Litton said, or Representative Litton said, that um, we need to, you know, the citizens of the 40th district are the most important. They're the persons we need to hear from, um, you know. And then, of course, lobbyists will come to our door, and but hopefully citizens will come to our door as well. And, um, yeah, the, the citizens of the 40th district are really important, and we need to, need to listen to them first before we listen to the lobbyists. Um, there is probably too much money in campaigns. <laughs> there are some places, I mean, they spend so much money on a state legislature race, a million dollars, you know, like back east and stuff. But so. Thank you. The legislature has set target limits for reducing emissions of greenhouse gases to address climate change. 
What policies, if any, would you support to meet this goal? And candidate Miller will start with you. Okay, I hate to do this, I'm sorry. Can you just repeat the question again? Certainly. The legislature has set target limits for reducing emissions of greenhouse gases to address climate change. What policies, if any, would you support to meet this goal? Well, our governor, Jay Inslee, he forged an agreement, a pact, with California and um, Canada on this. And it's kind of problematic. One thing they want to do is institute a carbon tax. A carbon tax is going to affect students, it's going to affect teachers, it's going to affect police officers, it's going to affect business owners, it's going to affect people out there struggling hard, like my brother up in Linden, to make a living with four kids. <laughs> he just has a newborn, you know. So basically, there is a problem with what G Governor Jay Inslee is trying to do. They also have this scheme where they want to charge per mile. Certainly greenhouse gases are a problem, but um, wrecking havoc on the citizens of Washington State is no way to go about it. Thank you. Candidate Linton? Yeah, the first thing I would do, and of course what we're doing is we're eliminating our coal-powered plants in our state. I, of course, support conservation and clean energy, but I also think that we need to do something to make it more expensive when you pollute. I believe it's our responsibility to clean up after ourselves and to grow our economy in a way that doesn't compromise our future. Thank you. Last question before closing statements. The options for where the money will come for funding K-12 through to satisfy McCleary is limited. Higher education, health care, and social services, where will you cut? And first person to answer would be candidate Linton, please. Yeah, I think I kind of answered this earlier in the earlier question. The first place that I would go is to our tax um, preferences and our tax exemptions. I believe that we have a responsibility to thoroughly analyze each of those to see what the return on investment is to grow our economy. And if it is not, we need to really look at those priorities of government, which for me is with education. And um, I think those will be very difficult. There will be hard battles to fight over closing any tax exemptions. I've sponsored or voted for closing tax exemptions every single year. I've been an Olympian, and I will continue to do so. We have a very regressive tax structure in our state. I think we need a comprehensive look at how we restructure our, our, our tax um, code in our state. We, I'm on the Finance Committee, so of course we're looking at all options, and for me all options are on the table, and it's going to take all of us um, with significant compromise to come to um, a, a conclusion um, with this session with McCleary. Thank you. Candidate Miller, please. So your qu the question was, where will the money come from to fund McCleary, right? Well, where, are you, where will you make cuts? Okay. Well, first of all, there was a show on Channel 9 years ago um, called The Paper Chase. It was about a professor. And they had to, you know, chase paper. That's what we're going to have to do. We're going to have to chase these cuts with a magnifying glass. But there is a lot of cuts out there that can be made. For one thing, the Department of Transportation is wasting lots of money on this ferry reservation system, this boondoggle up there in the San Juans. My sister, which is a teacher, has expressed um, cuts that could be made in, in the classroom. There are cuts that can be made and need to be made, and of course, we need to look at, we need to reach across the aisle, we need to look at this on a bipartisan manner, and we will, I'm confident, without a shadow of a, a doubt, come up with a decision, come up with the money needed to fund McClary in 2015. I don't think it'll go on past 2015. I think next year, that's going to be something we're going to do right out of the starting gate, and I believe we're going to be able to fund McClary. So no fear. <laughs> Thank you. And now we are going to do your closing statements. And candidate Miller, you will start for us. Well, like I said before, I'm concerned about jobs and building a good local economy and building a robust economy with manufacturing, agriculture, movie production, construction. I want to maintain freedom and liberty. Freedom and liberty is not spoken enough in the legislature. Smarter spending, like the Secretary of Treasury back in Rhode Island said, smarter spending is what needs to be done. Um, like, you know, uh, Eisenhower, he was a great president, Eisenhower was, and, and not too long ago, I was able to see his great-granddaughter, Laura Eisenhower, speak down there in Los Angeles area. And um, 
Like she says, when things get tough, play the music a little louder. Speaking of Los Angeles, I worked on um, medical malpractice issues in Los Angeles, as well as home health care issues. And I think seniors need to be able to stay in their homes. I believe we need to find a way to keep seniors in their homes um, that's better for them, and that's better for their families, you know, because if they, if they want to. And um, I want to work hard for the people of the 40th District, so thank you. Thank you. And candidate Linton, you're closing? Yeah, so the enormity of the situation is overwhelming, but I believe it creates opportunity, the opportunity of a crisis for us to come together. I spent the day today down in the Seattle area with um, Democrats, Republicans, and House members and Senate members, and we've been meeting once a month. We're going to amp that up a little bit, and we are trying to figure out how we find compromise and how we find solutions for our state to deal mainly with our McCleary issue. About two-thirds of our, our general fund budget is restricted, um, either from federal or the state constitution. So that area that we have to work with is very small. We have cut over $12 billion since I've been in the legislature. I don't know where else we would cut. Um, do we close a prison? Do we totally privatize our higher education? Do we walk away from our commitments to develop people with developmental disabilities? And I'm not willing to do that. Thank you. Now please join me in thanking Christine Litton and Daniel Miller for being here tonight. And for running for public office. Our next race is for position one of the 42nd District. The candidates running for this seat are Satpal Sidhu and Luann Van Werven. The same ground rules will apply. Thank you. Thank you, Annette. Good evening, candidates. Good evening. Good evening. Our next, or excuse me, we will be starting with your one minute opening statements. And since Ms. Van, or excuse me, candidate Van Werven won the dice toss and chose to open, shucks, I forgot to mark it. Did you want to open yep. first or close last? Close last. Thank you, yes. sorry about that. <clears throat> uh, and chose to close <clears throat> last. We will start with Mr. Sidhu. Yes. One minute. Okay, good evening. My name is Satpal Sidhu, my wife Mandar, and I have lived in Linden for 28 years. We've been married for 35 years. We raised three boys who attended Meridian schools. I am a Fulbright scholar. I'm an engineer. I'm an owner of a small business in Bellingham and a solar company executive and a former dean of Bellingham Technical College. I have managed companies with multi-million dollar budgets and profit and loss responsibilities. I immigrated with zero money, but three degrees. And I have made my life and my family's life on education. And I know how education can pull us out of poverty. And I have served on over a dozen boards and committees in this community for the last 25 years. Thank you very much. Thank you. Candidate Van Worven, please. Yes, and thank you to the League of Women Voters for your efforts to engage women in the political process. <clears throat> My name is Luann Van Worven, and I am married to Larry. We have four grown children and five adorable grandchildren. I am connected to the community through four generations who have come before me. I was raised in a hard-working family. My dad was a milk truck driver for Milky Way, and my mom, in addition to raising her six children, um, did bookkeeping on the side. I've been involved in community service for over 25 years. My mission has been to encourage others, particularly women, to get involved in the legislative and the political process in order to make a difference for their community. So, I put my name on the ballot after being encouraged to do so, and I would be very honored to be the first woman in 16 years to serve in this position. 
Thank you. Our first, our first question is, what do you believe are the top two things the legislature can do to preserve and enhance the vitality of agriculture in Whatcom County and throughout the state? Candidate Van Worven, we'll start with you. Well, agriculture is the, is the top industry in Whatcom County, and I believe we owe it to our farmers and to the egg growers to be very involved and to make them make sure that they're as successful as possible. I have, uh, through, of course, my dad's efforts, uh, very connected to the agriculture committee or to the agriculture community. And I know the farmers and I know their, their farmlands. I know their, the needs that they have. And so I think the most important thing we can do for them is to provide certainty when it comes to the water issue. There is, um, there is an issue not of uh, quantity but of allocation. And so we need to be able to provide for them answers for the future so that they can continue to expand their operations and to have certainty with the waters. This is an issue that the state legislature will have the opportunity to deal with, and I look forward to being a part of those answers. Thank you. Candidate Sadu. I come from a generations of farming families, and uh, I am involved in exporting blueberry and raspberry uh, from, from our local region. And I, under I understand the farmers and my extended families farming across the border and in this area. I think the two major things we need to preserve is the farmland. And this is a regional issue. The farmland in Whatcom County uh, preservation is much different than in Yakima or Walla Walla or other places. It depends like Okanagan. There are very few people live there and a lot of land. But we, as far as our district is concerned, we are having a lot of pressure on our land use and we must preserve our farming community, our farming character, and we must have policies in place so that, that we can reap those benefits in the next 25 years. Not yesterday, not tomorrow. Long-term thinking. Thank you. Do you support a two-thirds vote of the legislature to raise taxes? Candidate Sadu, please. No, I don't. I think that we have a constitution. We are, have been trying to do a hodgepodge system. We are trying to manage through initiatives. If we really like that, maybe we should have a TV monitor and vote every night for whatever we like. This is not a, a game show. We elect our representatives, we go through this process. We have to put trust in our legislature. We are doing that, we will send you there, but we don't trust you. That's not how we govern. We have a constitution. If we don't like our laws, let's change them. But this hodgepodge system is putting us behind, and you know the results of these initiatives. Because initiative people, they are very narrow-minded, narrowly worded, and it just stops real governance. I think this is a bad precedent. It should be used only in an exception, and it has become a rule. I don't like that. Thank you. Candidate Van Worven, please. Well, I'm in agreement with 65% of the voters in our district who believe that a two-thirds vote threshold should be required in the state legislature to raise taxes. I believe that this would be good for two reasons. First of all, it would require bipartisan cooperation on budgetary policy. It would force both parties to come together to scrutinize the policies more carefully, and I believe that we, we would be forced to prioritize our spending. Second of all, I don't think that uh, we have the, um, the ability to ask the hardworking families of Washington to pay more. I think that there's existing revenue available, and I think as a matter of prioritizing, I think we can get the job done. It would be a win-win situation for a two-thirds majority, and for these uh, reasons, I support constitutional amendment to require two-thirds vote to raise taxes. Thank you. The next question. Over the past 12 years, Construction costs have skyrocketed, while funding for maintenance and operations of roads and bridges has declined. How do you propose the legislature meet the needs of an aging and deteriorating transportation system? We will start with candidate Van Worven, please. 
Thank you for that. It's an important question. Uh, infrastructure in the state of Washington absolutely needs to be improved. I'm encouraged that the state legislature has um, added an additional $300 million to the transportation budget because this is going to provide the necessary um, the uh, upgrades that are needed. I believe that it, uh, in order to uh, have the, the movement of our commerce, we need to have the roads to provide that. I am very concerned about the focus not on relieving congestion, but maybe uh, too much focus on mass transit. We have uh, currently uh, more money that is going to mass transit than is being focused on, on our um, relieving of congestion. And all, we've all had the experience of driving through through the city of Seattle and King County to know that um, the, uh, the, tr the congestion is a problem and we need, to, we need to deal with that. Thank you. Candidate Sidhu, please. Twelve years ago, I'll tell you what happened. That Gary Locke said that let's put nine cents gas tax and gas was dollar ten. And that would have, by today, we would have solved all the problem of paving. We don't even have to build the highways. We just have to maintain them and pave them. Somebody else built it for us. That were our fathers and grandfathers. And we couldn't agree on that. The argument was, well, it'll kill the economy. We can't compete. Transportation companies will go out of business. And the gas went to $4 anyways. And we did not do anything. And 12 years later, we're having the same arguments. This is called vision. I think the Republican Party had no vision, and they were passing initiatives and initiative against it, and that's where we are in the mess. The thing which would have costed 10 billion, it's going to cost 30 billion, and now we don't have money. That's why I look for long-term solutions, bold solutions, which will actually benefit our kids and grandkids, not yesterday or tomorrow. Thank you. Thank you. The next question. Governor Inslee has proposed some ideas to deal with carbon emissions. What bill would you introduce or sponsor to cope with climate change? Uh, yeah. We will start with candidate Sidhu. Yes. First of all, climate science is true. There are a lot of people with their head in sand and not agreeing with that, but it is true. It's been done for the last 50, 70 years. But we have to do something. And that's the, again, every time you talk about climate, clean air, clean water, go back like 30, 40 years, there has been, never been a leadership in the Republican Party that we need this. They enjoy the good, uh, good environment. They talk about it. Oh, how nice it is that we live in Whatcom County, have a clean air. Where did it come from? It came from long-term planning. Somebody was actually sacrificing for that. And every time, same thing with OSHA, it will kill the industry. And, 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 you know, like, that's what I'm saying, that we have to have bold solutions, think long term, and, and, and have sensible solutions. And there are scare tactics of, oh, they're going to be $2 tax, $1 tax. What if the gas goes up anyways because something happens in Iran? What do we do then? Thank you. Thank you. Candidate Van Worven, please. Well, if the science was settled, we would still believe that uh, the earth revolves around, or the sun revolves around a flat earth. The truth is, is that uh, Governor Inslee's climate policy has been tried before in Europe, and it was a notorious failure. Um, Governor Inslee's proposals are expensive, they are complicated, and they will do nothing to reduce the emissions here in Washington State. It will hurt business and job creation at a time when the economy is still struggling to come back from the recession. So in addition to his uh, cap and trade policies, he is proposing a low carbon fuel standard, which will raise the tax on gas by over a dollar per gallon. I'm not sure we're really prepared to pay over $5 per gallon of gas. This is a regressive tax that will hurt the middle class and the low income earners the worst. And uh, I think our, our uh, tax burden is too high, and we are taxed enough already, and this is a failed idea. Thank you. Do you think it's important to support native tribal sovereignty? If so, how will you do so? Candidate Van Werven. Thank you. Um, tribal sovereignty is, uh, is very important to our, our Indian tribes. And I can appreciate that. I certainly do. 
I have come alongside in my years of working as a citizen legislator down in, in uh, Olympia. I have worked on tribal issues and their right to remain independent and their right to be able to keep the gambling on their tribal lands. Um, I have fought the Republicans on this is issue, actually, when they wanted to extend it into um, private, private businesses. And I came alongside, worked with Democrats, and uh, we made sure that uh, the, uh, the tribal casinos or the casinos were limited to tribal lands. So I, um, and I've appreciated meeting with them. I think we have a lot of common ground. They care about water issues. We care about water issues. And so we're going to come together for a win-win situation, a win-win solution uh, for the both of us. Thank you. Candidate Sadu. Yes, I do support that. And I think that we have a trust deficit which has been generated over years and years of mistreatment and, and encroaching. If you, if you look from their perspective, which I have had several meetings with, with the leadership at, at the Lummi tribe, that, that their rights are being encroached by different ways and means. But the, the biggest issue is, is there's no trust and that trust does not come with a piece of paper or sitting one day. That trust comes from years and years of working together. And I think we have a partner in our, in amidst uh, all the tribes in our state and in the United States. If we uh, work with that premise, a government to government relations or a tribal uh, rights, treaties because we got consideration for that. We got all the land and then gave them the reservation and the treaty. We must honor those. Thank you. Thank you. Some, including the governor, have proposed eliminating tax exemptions to meet the Supreme Court mandate to fully fund K-12 education. Do you believe this is a viable approach or do you have alternative suggestions? And we will start with candidate Sadhu, please. This is very viable approach because I'll give you an example that whenever we give a tax break, there's no sunset on that. And I have talked about this issue several times. Uh, for last 50, 60 years, suppose there was a one industry, I give example of timber industry, it doesn't matter uh, which, which name I use, but if they needed some help, we gave it to them and then it becomes it a permanent. And we have done that over last 60 years. There's 600 some uh, 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 tax incentives or subsidies, whatever you call it. This is actually an expense. This is not a giveaway. This is an expense which belongs to all of us. We should have a 10-year sunset on any subsidy, anything we give it to, any industry, any place, sales tax, bio tax, whatever tax. And we should review it every 10 years. If it is good, continue. If not, then it should be taken out. And that's why and uh, 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 reforming of our BO and O-tax and, and sales tax. Thank you. Thank you. Candidate Van Worven, please. Well, the tax code is extremely complex, but we need to distinguish between tax breaks and subsidies. Tax breaks are, is a reduction of taxes that are already being paid uh, by companies, by individuals. Um, companies use tax breaks when they want to expand their operations or hire people. And, and these are actually a net benefit for our economy. Donations um, to charities and deducting our mortgage um, interest is considered a loophole. Are we prepared to, to remove that? We need to be very precise when we talk about this because a loophole can actually be a, of great benefit to the families. So. The U.S. government has a ridiculously high um, corporate tax of 39% or 35%. It's the highest in the world. And uh, that's why you see companies like Burger King moving their headquarters, their operations, up to Canada because they only, sir, they only have a 17% corporate tax rate. So I'm curious how will we fund the K through 12 education? And we'll start with you, candidate Van Werven. Well, education um, is one of the most important um, things that we can fund, uh, that we can put our money towards. But simply throwing more money is not the answer. 
we need to reform the system and make it more responsive to the needs of students and families. So we already spend over $11,000 per student in Washington State. When I go to Olympia, I will consider four decision-making principles when it comes to education. We need to change the funding mechanism when it comes to um, education and what we spend on student services. Number two, we need to provide options for families. Online learning. We need to have alternative learning skills, uh, skill centers for them. We need to customize education. Um, in this age of iPhones and smartphones, we don't need to be doing it the same way we always have. And number four, we need to serve the families and students first. We need a better allocation of our funds to ensure that the money goes where it's going to benefit the most. Thank you. Candidate Sadhu, please. When we started this campaign, that's where I started from, that don't concentrate on the money first. First fix the system. If you read the McCleary decision, it clearly says putting more money into this outdated, outmoded system will not solve the problem. Well, finally, people are realizing that, which is a good thing. Uh, I think that first we should see like early childhood learning is not part of K-12. We should include that. And we should look at this first, reform the system, then see what money is needed to do that. Same thing like uh, class size. It's one piece of everything. We cannot hodgepodge do this. And we should have a 20-year plan and fund for 20 years, not in 2015, not in 2017. We cannot reform our education if we keep patching it. Duct tape is not the solution. The solution is we got to really fix our education system and fund it properly. Thank you. Thank you. The next question is, I am a gay identified man. Would you support LGBTQ issues to bring equality for me? I think I'll just say one line. Justice and liberty for all. That's our constitution, that's our pledge, and all means all. And that's where I stand with this. Thank you, candidate. Was there more to that question, or was that? No, that yeah. was the question. I smiled because he seems to always know when he's going first and comes <laughs> right in there. So, <laughs> it startled me. Would you like me to repeat it? Sure. Okay. I'm a gay identified man. Would you support uh, it's lesbian, gay, bi, transsexual, queer issues to bring equality for me? Well, we are all equal in the eyes of God. Everybody has equality. And so I, I'm not even sure that I understand the premise of that question. I believe in respect and dignity for all individuals, no matter, no matter if they are gay or straight. And so... Um, the answer is, of course, you, we are all equal. So. Thank you. All right. Untreated serious mental illness and chemical dependency disorders overwhelm our criminal justice system and other public services. What are your priorities with regards to funding mental health services? And we will start with candidate Van Worven, please. Currently in our budget, 30% of the revenue that comes in goes to fund health care and human services. I believe that a, a civilized society will always have a safety net for those who need it most. Um, but the, the problem we have is when we try to take a more of a, a global or a statewide perspective on these things when it, it really is a local issue. And so that's why I'm always supportive of government working with public and private um, charities that um, address the real needs of the people who have the issues with chemical dependence and mental illness. And so I am, um, I mean, this is a top priority of what, uh, this is what a civilized country will do for, the, for those who are most vulnerable. Thank you. Candidate Sadhu, please. I have been on the board of Whatcom Counseling uh, organization which is Compass now for four years. Uh, that was a big eye-opener for me 
to learn that how serious this issue is. And we are all paying for it. We think we sweep it under the rug and don't talk about it. The families don't talk about, the neighbors don't talk about. We all pay for it. You know how we pay for it? Our law enforcement. 30% of their money and time is spent on these issues. They have to take these people in, release them next morning, hospitals, uh, ERs, all these things. We must bring it in open and make it at like a need or a healthcare problem like all other healthcare issues, like a diabetic person. We have rules for that. We have uh, prescriptions for that. We take care of that and we pay for that. We should bring it in light. We should, uh, we should face it head on. We will save a lot more money and, and less crime, less issues. Thank you. Thank you. The Growth Management Act became law in 1990. What is your view of how it has functioned and what, if any, specific changes would you propose to the legislature? Yes. Uh, yes, candidates. Okay. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> I'm trying to save time. <laughs> I know, and you're so good. <laughs> Sorry about that. Go ahead. Uh, I think uh, Growth Management Act is a, a, a good way to govern ourselves for future. We have to leave our state, our region, better than what we got from our parents for our kids. Uh, but this is not a universal legislature thing that one rule fits all. The issues in Whatcom County are different than Skagit County, different than Walla Walla, different than uh, Yakima. I think the overall, overall policy legislature should be GMA, and but all other decisions should be taken locally because we have very fertile land and we have a pressure of people moving into Bellingham because best place to live here. So we have to balance that, and that solution has to be our local solution. GMA is a good thing, but we must manage it locally, make more decisions, and put all the stakeholders, the farmers, the realtors, uh, the communities, and uh, our uh, uh, transportation people, uh, transit people, together to solve these issues. Thank you. Thank you. Candidate Van Worven, please. Well, I don't agree that the Growth Management Hearings Board is a board of politically appointed people. I think from the get-go, then, we are looking at a biased body. And uh, I appreciate the fact that the state legislature has allowed for some counties to opt out of the Growth Management Act. I believe that a one-size-fits-all at the state level is not to the best interest of the communities. And I would definitely support the ability uh, for the continued ability for counties to opt out if it is not serving their best interests. And uh, I just will go back to the fact that it's the local county boards, commissions that need to be making these, deci these decisions that are in the best interest of the local communities. Thank you. Do you support either of the gun initiatives? Why or why not? And we'll start with candidate Van Worven, please. Okay, I have some, uh, I haven't decided about 591. I'm still researching that, but 594, I have some serious concerns about. First of all, um, they, under the promise of safer streets and safety, um, we have uh, forgotten the fact that in the state of Washington, we do have strong background checks. And it is designed to make sure that the, the uh, criminals and the mentally ill do not have access to guns. They will find a way to get guns. But um, I am with Senator, or I'm with uh, Sheriff Elfo on this, where he has very much uh, concerns about the implementation of this. Um, the Washington State uh, sheriffs and police officers are stand in opposition to this as well, and uh, and I think that it all comes down to a badly written initiative. And which centers on one word, and that is transfer. And how are we going to define what transfer really means? Thank you. Candidate Sadu, please. I support I-594 and do not support 591. I think what Bill Elfo has said, that he does not like this law. He, it's, he didn't say sport or not sport. What he says, this does not go far enough. It creates more work for them. He would rather like to see a much stronger closed system so that we can control it. I'm going to read something to you. 
I own the most powerful weapon which I can carry anywhere without any permits or registration. This weapon protects me, protects my family, and protects my community without harming anyone. My weapon is education. I challenge all the gun owners of America, Republicans and Democrats, that education will protect our lifestyle and our prosperity much more than Second Amendment can ever do. Uh, excuse me, hold your pause, please. Thank you. Thank you. In the Nooksack River Basin and elsewhere in the state, there are water rights problems. What, if anything, do you propose the legislature do to avoid serious limits to water supplies in the future? And please explain your response. We will start with candidate Sadu, please. This is again an issue that there is a water right issue all over our state, but the conditions are different in every region, every area. So we cannot have legislature decide because that will be not, they will be winners and losers. The issues we have in Whatcom County, we need to get all the stakeholders on one table. You know, we have issue, we have industry. A lot of places don't have industry which uses that much water. We have farming, dairy, and berry industry. We have salmon. We have tribal rights. We have cities, and more and more pressure on cities. And we have citizens who own five acres and exempt wells. So you can imagine how many vested interests are, and they are all pulling towards. The solution is we must build our trust level more than water level. I think that if we build trust among all the stakeholders and find local solutions, we can all be winners. Courts only makes winners and losers. We don't want to go there with millions of dollars. Thank you. Thank you. Candidate Van Orven, please. The uh, state legislature will be looking at, at a couple of options that would provide certainty for our ag lands, for our farmers who need to have that water. It's not a matter that we don't have enough water, it's just how we allocate it. And we, were gonna, we are going to work with the tribes to make sure that we have a win-win situation where uh, everybody has, um, has a stake in this. So a couple of things that we're going to be looking at, um, possibly providing funding for a for transfer of water across the North County from a deep water aquifer that is located in Blaine. Um, there is that uh, great potential that we can be involved in. The other thing is that currently municipalities do not have the ability to receive any credit for the extra water that they put into the Nooksack River. Municipalities are exempt from that, and I think maybe it's time to take a look at that and see if maybe they should receive credit for the water that they put back into the river. Thank you. Do you support a $15 minimum wage. We will start with candidate Van Werven, please. Well, I, I think it's a questionable um, social experiment. And uh, what it does is it encourages employers to lay off people and uh, to move or move them into part-time positions. Um, we see that automation is becoming more prominent as uh, it is actually cheaper than buying um, or then paying for the additional uh, employees with higher minimum wage. Um, I think it's hardest on disadvantaged youth to get their first job. Employers will value people who already have that job experience over those who are unknown. Um, we are fortunate in our business that we have a skilled workforce and they um, and their wages are far above the minimum wage, but I would just say that this is something that is going to hurt businesses and it's going to actually increase the prices of goods um, for all people. Thank you. Candidate Sadu, please. You know, if you look at it right now, there's a disparity of minimum wage all across the nation. If you look at Kentucky, where the wage is $7.50 and we have about $10. You know, you look at the economy, they're not better off than us, and we are not worse off than them. And our businesses are not failing every day because we are paying $10, they're paying $7. I think there is a different criteria we need to look at. I don't know, is $15, $12, $11, whatever. What I know is 
that if person is working 40 hours, husband and wife, they should not be needing food stamps, they should not be needing go to food bank to make their, make their life uh, um, uh, ends meet. Uh, they should be able to buy a house, uh, send their kids to school or college, and we are not doing that. This is a much bigger problem than just talking about minimum wage. We cannot race to the bottom. We cannot race to the bottom. Thank you. Hey, uh, excuse me. Please, hold the applause to the end. We're almost there. Uh, candidates, we're going to have your uh, closing statements. And let's see. I would like to start with Mr. Sidhu, or Candidate Sadhu. Uh, we have a one minute to give us your closing statement, please. I'm a first generation immigrant, came here 40 years ago with no money but three degrees. I built my life, my family on education, and I know how education can pull us out of poverty. This is an investment we must make for our future. I'm an independent thinker. I have bold ideas and bold solutions which will affect our kids and grandkids. I don't think in yesterdays, I don't think in tomorrows. I'm a Fulbright scholar, I'm an engineer, I'm a business owner, I have balanced budgets, I have created jobs, I have built alliances, I have served on the 12 different boards in the community. I have the experience, I have the ability to take this experience and abilities to Olympia and serve you. I will be honored to get your vote, thank you. Thank you. Candidate Van Werven, yes, please. Thank you. I recognize that our quality of life depends on a vibrant economy. And I am proud of our family business and how we have created hundreds of local jobs right here in Whatcom County. I represent the hardworking women who have raised their families and have been parts of uh, successful businesses. And um, I understand what it takes to run a business. My husband and I have been a team. Together we raised our children, we managed our household, and we ran a successful business. My opponent has called me extreme, without actually naming a position or an issue. But this is my commitment to you. When I go to Olympia, I will be extremely competent. I will be extremely hardworking, and I will be extremely effective for the problems and the issues that we have right here in Whatcom County. Thank you again, and I would be honored to receive your vote. Please join me in thanking both the candidates. Thank you both for running and for your service and for being here tonight. And we are now at the final race of the evening, and this is for position two of the 42nd District. I'd like to welcome to the podiums Vincent Baez and Joy Monjury. The same ground rules for the forum will apply. Great. We will be starting with your one-minute opening statements. And since uh, candidate Manjuri won the dice toss this evening, and you chose to open first, correct? All right, we That's will correct. start with, with you, candidate Manjuri. Thank you. Thank you to the league. Um, I should use my minute up here. I am Joy Manjuri, and um, I should be using my minute to explain more about my background. But um, something happened to me this week that really disturbed me, and I need to share. I received an email, and uh, in the email, they were encouraging people to come tonight to the forum and support uh, Luann Van Werven and Vincent Baez. And um, the reason that they wanted people to come was because they were walking in to the heart of the enemy. When I read this, I got sick to my stomach. And then I got mad. Because the League of Women Voters doesn't endorse political candidates. They do bring the community together to talk about hard issues. And then I got sad because I'm not an enemy. And Vincent's not my enemy. We're nice people that just have a difference opinion of opinion about what needs to be done and how to do it. 
And that's the kind of language that's tearing our country apart and causing political gridlock. Thank you. Thank you. Candidate Byes, your one minute opening statement, please. Okay. Well, thank you everybody for being here. Thank you to the League of Women Voters for offering this opportunity for us to reach out to the constituents and really let them know. And thank you to the millions of people at home that are just tantalized uh, watching this event there. Uh, we, we know you're excited about that. That's something I got from Ross Hunter. He's our budget chair. He always does that <laughs> down Olympia. Because we know there's so many people that are excited. But we do uh, appreciate you all being here. All of us candidates would do. I know that. And my name is Vincent Baez, and I am your current state representative, and I'm asking for your support again to go down and serve you for the next two years. Over the last four years, I believe that I've served effectively down in the legislature, serving the, the needs of Whatcom County, whether it's agriculture, whether it's jobs, whether it's education, whether it's higher education, or whether it's homeless housing. I've been an advocate for all these, and I will continue to do so. I look forward to your questions tonight and, and hope we can have a great debate. Thank you. Thank you. Our first question. The state Supreme Court has found the legislature, legislature in contempt of its 2012 mandate to fully fund K-12 education. What are your thoughts on this decision and sh what should be the legislative response? I believe we're going to start with you, Candidate Vice. Well, thank you. So the, the Supreme Court found us in, in contempt as a state, actually not as the legislature. But as a state, we are in contempt and I believe that we can find that funding. Right now, if we were to run the exact same budget that we ran last year, for every organization, every agency, we would have an excess of $3 billion left over if every agency got the exact same amount that they got last year. So what I propose doing is of that new budget growth, about 7% increase to the state of Washington next year, that we take the first two-thirds of that and put that into education and re use the remaining $1 billion to put towards other government growth. Thank you. Can candidate Monjuri, please. Well, I think that education is going to be the most important issue for the legislature next year, and I think there's several ways to approach it. We need to look at efficiencies in our education system. We need to look at cuts, and we need to look at new and sustained funding. I don't believe that we're going to be able to meet that mandate without those things. There is excessive standardized testing required right now in our schools, and those tests cost money, and that's one of the places that we should be looking. Um, our class sizes are too big, and we have children coming who are living in poverty, and teachers cannot teach children living in poverty and children that are in happy, sta um, stable homes and be able to give them both a good education. Um, I think we need to the, uh, bring local food into our schools. Uh, we have wonderful farmers in our community, and I think that we need to be nourishing those children, especially those living in poverty that depend on schools for most of their nourishment. Um, I think that there's lots to be done, and I am excited about going there and working with the legislature to get it done. Thank you. What is your view of the proper role of government and how will it guide your decisions as an elected official? If you are elected in November, how would you apply that philosophy to specific issues before the legislature? And that would be beginning with you, candidate Manjuri. Um, I think the role of government um, is to make sure that the basic needs of our citizens are met. I think that right now that's not happening. There are too many people that are uh, working full-time jobs and still relying on government for, uh, for their basic needs of housing and food and health care. And I think that uh, it, what we're doing is we're subsidizing companies. Um, we are basically, it's corporate welfare. And I think that government has a responsibility and our, all of our citizens have a responsibility to those that are less fortunate and that those that are more vulnerable. And I think that that is government's role, is to make sure that we all have a standard of living that is the American dream. Thank you. Candidate Bice, please. Well, at the federal level, I believe that the role of government is for the national security and to provide that infrastructure, such as our, our highways and that sorts of things. At the state level, I believe it is, and our Constitution says, that it is the paramount duty of the state of Washington to provide for ample education uh, for our citizens. And that is one of those things that... Uh, is one of the core functions of government in Washington State, and we need to make sure that we continue to look at that, and also the infrastructure here at the state level. We also have local level infrastructure, and I believe that those are things that the government is best served to do in providing that necessary infrastructure that everybody uses. 
Thank you. Uh, do you favor that all regulations be subject to a cost-benefit analysis and be repealed if they fail? And we will start with candidate vice, please. Absolutely. In fact, we've been working with uh, the Department of Commerce and some of our other agencies over the last couple of years, and Representative um, Norm Smith has really been moving forward a lot of this legislation, looking at what are uh, the costs that are going into a lot of our regulations as we're creating them. And so when we sit down and look at a particular legislation that looks at policy changing regulation, we want to know what is the cost of that regulation or that policy going to be. Uh, and, and I think we should have that, whether the policy is for, for tax incentives, for tax uh, increases, or for regulatory increases. Thank you. Candidate Mongeri, please. Uh, I definitely agree. I think that that's been uh, part of the problem of government, is that we have gone too many years not looking at the cost benefit of the regulations and um, the laws that we pass. I think that what's happened is um, as our economy has changed and um, more and more um, money is there and more and more people are here, that those cost benefits change and we need to, like um, Candidate Sadu said, every 10 years we need to be looking at the cost benefit of most of the regulations and the laws that we pass. I agree. Thank you. Demand for water will continue to be a hot button issue with competing user groups like the agricultural community, tribes, industry, cities, fishing interests, etc. What approaches would you support to help mitigate issues in the future? And candidate Manjuri, we'll start with you. A prosperous agricultural economy is really important to Whatcom County, and I'm a huge advocate of that. That being said, um, our water rights issues in this community have been pending for too long. And basically that's because we have a lot of fear and honestly I think racism in our community. Um, the tribal right is the first right by, the fed, by federal law. It's first in time, first in right. Um, they are the first ones here, therefore they have the first right. And I think this community has the will and the intelligence and the need to sit down with the tribes and negotiate and figure out how much they need for their economy. And it's something that has been going on for way too long now, and I am supportive and hoping to pass legislation to promote that here. It's been done in other states, it's been done successfully, and this community, it's time that we did that. Thank you. Candidate Bias, please. We've been working on legislation the last couple of years to address just some of those issues here in Whatcom County. And some of the, the encouraging things that we've been seeing out of other areas in the, in the state, especially the Ellensburg, Yakima Basin area, is working with uh, the interest groups, whether it's tribes, whether it's uh, agriculture, whether it's industry, and the State Department of Ecology coming up with solutions that work for everybody. And so in Ellensburg, they just signed some new packs up there for the Cleelum area that really address some of the concerns and now they're working with things such as water banking, getting those types of systems involved and then really taking a holistic approach and I, I definitely support looking at that here in Whatcom County and we have been working on that and uh, working on getting some of those, uh, those rights adjudicated whether it be the tribal or whether it be the agriculture. Thank you. Do you support either of the gun initiatives? Why or why not? And we'll start with candidate Bies, please. So I, I do have some concerns with the, the first initiative. Uh, that would be nine, or 591. Yeah, but in general, I support that one. What it does, and there's a little bit of misinformation about that, is it's saying it gets rid of all background checks. Well, that actually doesn't. So what it does, right now in Washington State, we have a federal background check, and we have a duplicate state background check. So what this, it basically eliminates the state duplication so that there's just one background check that you do, and the federal is the more stringent of those, and then if that federal changes, then it would change here at the state level. I don't support uh, 594 because of the transfer aspects of it, and there's a lot of other things there. The language is very, uh, very confusing because when you look at it, it says, yes, while hunting, it's an exemption. That means I have to be with you when we're hunting in order to, to allow my gun to be transferred to another individual. If I want to allow my gun to be transferred and not be on that hunting trip with my friend, it would require me and him to go in and, and file a fee and do a background check, and I don't think that's appropriate. 
Thank you. Candidate Manjuri, please. Yes, I do support 594. Um, I support responsible gun ownership. Um, my husband has a gun. I believe people should be, be able to have a gun. But the gun advocates will say, say to you that it's the person, not the gun, that kills. And if that's the case, then I would think they would be supporting this because what it's doing is it's keeping guns out of people with mental health issues, out of children's hands, and um, out of criminals. So uh, I don't believe that sharing, from what my understanding, sh uh, sharing is not transferring. Transferring is actually selling the gun is, well, that's, I just heard that recently. Um, but anyway, stricter gun laws have been in other states and it has proven to, to slow down the number of deaths in those states. They're supported by um, our former chief of police here, Don Pierce supports this, and it's also to protect our police officers because um, people that are mentally ill or unstable shouldn't have guns. Thank you. 28 states have adopted health care exchanges, signing up tens of thousands who either had no insurance or, or were underinsured. Do you support Obamacare? And we will start with candidate Manjuri. I believe the Affordable Care Act is a good thing. Um, I think that if more people are insured, it's going to save all of us money. Um, that being said, I think that there needs to be some improvements. I just spoke to a woman on the phone yesterday whose uh, premiums have gone very high. And I honestly don't understand um, how that's happening or if it's being addressed. I think it is being addressed. I believe that if we don't insure people, we're all paying their bills when they go to the emergency room. And um, I believe that everybody should have a right to basic health care. Thank you. Candidate Buys, please. I don't support uh, the Affordable Care Act as it is, and it has been an issue in Washington State. One of the issues uh, that we're dealing with in my office is with some constituents where they had signed up under the exchange, uh, going to the Washington Health Exchange Finder, and they got plans. They got the bills for the plans. They've been paying the plans, but when they went in to go and get their, uh, their diabetic medicine, they were refused, saying they don't have coverage. So what we've got is an issue where they've got their name into the system enough to know how to bill them, but not enough to purchase the insurance. I do, what I do like about it is the ability that the insurance products are private market insurance products. So you're still buying Group Health, you're still buying Regents, Blue Shield, you're still buying Kaiser Permanente, what, those, those sorts of products. Uh, but I don't support what some of the... Uh, some of the mandates that have been put in there that increase the cost on those. So we, we have to look at opening that up, allowing a little bit more of an individualized plan that individuals can work with their primary health care provider to, to assess their needs. Thank you. And to kind of tie into that a little bit, what are your priorities for state funding of health and social services in a time of limited resources? Please be specific about proposed cuts or raising revenue. Candidate Buys, we'll follow up with you there. So this has been one of the, the big issues, and especially in the developmental disability area that I've really been focused on. Uh, last year, there was a, some good legislation that came through our Appropriations Committee that went and it got more federal money to come down for a disabled community. I have a sister with uh, Down syndrome, and so I see the need that a lot of other people in our community have dealing with whether it's kids or, or even young adults or grown adults in the disability community. And these are one of those communities that we absolutely have to support as a state and as a community because they're the ones that can't support themselves. And so that is, I believe, also when we're looking at some of the core functions of the local state government or even the local governments, that's where I would like to see us. And even the local community outside of government really stepping up. As far as the federal government, I don't think that's a place where they should be involved because you really get that care that you need and understanding of the situation at the ground level. Thank you. Candidate Manjuri, please. Um, I believe that our social services need to be strengthened. Um, we have a lot of homeless in this community. I believe that it's been proven that if you provide stable homes for people, that they will stay there and we will not be having them in, a, in the emergency room and in our court system. Um, there's a lot of poverty in our community that often we don't see. A one in every six people in Whatcom County actually lives below the poverty line, and 42% of single-parent families with female heads of household are below the f poverty line. Um, more than 11,000 of our children 
uh, under 18 are eligible for free and reduced lunches. I think that's a shame because poor kids are 25 more likely to drop, 25 percent more likely to drop out of school. They're 40 percent more likely to be teen parents, and they're 70 cent, 70 percent more likely to get arrested. So I think we need to take care of our underserved and um, also raising the minimum wage so that they can make a living uh, is another good way to do that. Okay, thank you. Give us an example of an issue on which you have changed your mind based on more facts. Uh, candidate Manjuri. <laughs> <laughs> Um, changed my mind. Hmm. Found more facts. Um, gosh, that's a tough one. Uh, well, I support industrial hemp, but I didn't really have an opinion on it. Um, I am supporting it because I know the facts and I know how um, prosperous it could make our farmers. I don't have anything that I've changed my mind recently that I can think of because of more facts. Sorry. Thank you for sharing. Well, she stole mine, so I'll just talk about a different one. <laughs> um, so, yes. so one of the things that we've been dealing with in the legislature uh, with regard to termination of parental rights, and that's when parents have decided not to be involved in their, in their child's lives, and they're in the foster care system, or they're in... Uh, yeah, basically the foster care system. And so this was an issue I didn't really understand a whole lot, and I came to it with a lot of hesitation towards it because I have very, very strong uh, parental rights supporter. But when we look at the, uh, really the effect that that has on kids when their parents don't want them, when there are foster parents or there are adoptive parents that want them, to be able to have the state come in and finalize those parental rights on parents that really don't want to be involved in, that was an issue I didn't support at first, but then once, once I got to understanding it, I was, I was able to support that, and I think I was one of the only ones in my caucus on that uh, committee that were able to support it out of the uh, committee. Thank you. What are your views about the proposed Gateway Pacific Coal Terminal at Cherry Point, an increased number of Burlington Northern Santa Fe trains cruising through Whatcom County? Uh, candidate Bies will start with you. So we have a robust system in place to make sure that we have great environmental controls. Uh, Department of Ecology is going to be doing a thorough uh, investigation of the env environmental impact that that project is going to have out there. So as, as far as the legislature is concerned, there's not a whole lot we can do. That comes down to the, the county council here, and they're the ones that get to make the decision. So, I th oh, he's still in the room. He's supposed to leave, but, you know. So, so the county council is really going to be the one that makes that determination. I believe that, that we need to, to go through that process, and I support that process. And if at the end of that process it comes through, and the environmental mitigation or requirements uh, are, are stringent, and the, the proponents of that decide to go ahead and invest that money, then they should have a right to do so. Thank you. Candidate Manjuri, please. Well, I have um, serious concerns about the proposal for Cherry Point. Um, I understand that uh, there's an average of nine freight train derailments a month in our country, and I'm very concerned about the, uh, the rail safety issue. Um, that being said, I think a deep water port at, Cher port at Cherry Point would be very good for our economy. Um, I think it would provide jobs. I think that uh, it would be a good thing if it wasn't built to export um, products that were going to harm our environment or harm human health. Um, around the planet, not just us. Um, I think that this community has the most amazing environment and it's our greatest asset. And I think anything that we do that um, puts a risk to that ac asset is irresponsible. And um, I think in the long run, if they come and we do have an accident here, that there, we are all gonna be extremely sorry that we ever made the decision to allow that kind of commodity traveling through our communities. Thank, uh, hold applause, please. While it's important to fund education, what concrete plans do you have to make sure that the roads and bridges our children and families travel over every day are safe? 
Candidate Mongeri, we'll start with you. Well, um, after 23 years with the city of Bellingham, I became um, very aware of how our infrastructure is aging and failing all over the country. Uh, it's a concern of the American Public Works Association nationwide. Um, I believe that we need to pass a transportation budget, but I also believe that not only our roads and our bridges need to be repaired, but also our water systems and our wastewater systems and all the things that we depend on. Uh, I think that it will bring good jobs, uh, family wage jobs to Whatcom County if we pass a transportation budget. And when I go to Olympia, I intend to make sure that happens. Candidate Bice. So we have passed a transportation budget every year. Uh, we may not have always passed a supplemental transportation budget, but I have supported the transportation budgets in the past, and I look forward to looking at what's going to be included in our next transportation budget. Uh, I believe we can fund the things that we need to. We can make sure that uh, the safety and our road maintenance, that is maintained. One of the great things that came out of the, the unfortunate event with the Skagit River Bridge is that we saw how efficient government can be in rebuilding that. It was, a, it was a great testimony to if we just let our agencies go and do the project, we can do it effectively, we can do it efficiently, we can do it cost effectively, and we can get the projects done. If we take that same model and apply it to our other state projects, we can do it, it within a great budget. And also looking at our recent tra the transportation budget we have, when we passed the initial transportation budget, it was the largest transportation budget we've ever passed in the state, and then a supplemental transportation budget, which we passed last session, added an over $300 million to that transportation budget. Thank you. What specific legislation and or policies do you believe are necessary to sustain and support agriculture, which are, is a major ec economic factor in our county and state? And I'd like to start with candidate Bice, please. Well, I grew up on a dairy farm out in Whatcom County, so d agriculture, dairy specifically, is very important to me. But we also have a lot of uh, berry, dairy, potatoes, uh, and a lot of other unique things. Whatcom County and Skagit County are very vital, not only to our local agriculture economy, but the world's. Uh, Skagit County is one of the leading producers of agricultural seed products that go out around the world. So water is going to be one of the primary things I think that's going to be a essential for that because you can't have agriculture without water. So we're going to continue working on the, that type of legislation. Uh, also property rights are a big issue for agriculture, making sure that, that farmers can utilize their property if they need to build other sheds on a portion of their property, that they're able to do that because if you don't have the infrastructure for your farm, it's very, very difficult to continue to, to you know, do your farm, to, to farm. Thank you. Uh, candidate Mongeri, please. Well, I think that uh, agriculture in Whatcom County is part of who we are. It's part of our character. Um, and we are so fortunate to have a community that values our agriculture. And with the climate change going on right now on, around the globe, this is going to become much more important in the future, that we are a community that can grow our own food and can grow food for other people in the, in the world. Um, so I believe that we need to preserve our agriculture. I believe value-added processing, more value-added processing facilities. We've lost many of those, and I think um, trying, to, um, trying to create more of those or encourage uh, processing companies to come here would be a good thing. And again, that would, be able, that would enable us to get our local food into our schools, into our senior centers, into our hospitals. We could be eating more of our local food if we were able to process it and have it over the winter months when we're not growing. So I, am, I believe that we need to ensure their water, and I think that it will, um, it will benefit all of us in the long run. Thank you. Do you support a $15 minimum wage, candidate Mongeri? I have no idea what the right number is, but I support a wage that will give people the basic needs, enable them to not rely on government services to meet their basic needs. One of the concerns I have, and I honestly don't know what the answer to this is, and I'm really anxious to, um, to go to Olympia because I think you learn a lot when you're there. <laughs> Um, one of the things that concerns me is how it will impact a small business because 
I have a small business, and when I decided to run for the legislature, I realized that I couldn't run my small business uh, without some help. So I wanted to get help, but I couldn't afford, because it's a farm stand, and you don't make a lot of money in a farm stand, <laughs> I couldn't afford to pay someone a living wage and pay their benefits. So how that wage is going to affect small businesses has me concerned. I have some ideas on how we might look at it, but, um, but I believe that people need to be making a living wage, yes. Thank you. Candidate Bice, please. So right now, Washington State has one of the highest minimum wages uh, anywhere in the United States. But one of the things we also have is a very, very tight, or very high tax burden. And so when we talk about the ability of a business to hire somebody, there's so much more that impacts a person than just their take-home pay. Uh, a lot of times people don't realize the amount of money that's reduced on their, their, their bill or their, their pay stub that goes to government through different government programs. They don't understand the cost that in order to hire a person, there's more than just the salary cost. For right, instance, right now in the timber industry, if you are a logger in a, one of the high-risk timber areas, you are paying L&I. Your business that hires you is paying l and I. I believe it's over $20 an hour per person. That goes directly to l and I. That's not your wages. So you might get $20 an hour as, a, as an individual. Your, your company is also paying an extra $20 to l and I, plus all the other stuff, the labor and workforce are the... Um, unemployment insurance, and, and everything else to go along with it. Thank you. Shortage of farm labor is a big issue in our county. What are your ideas that the legislature could utilize to solve the problem? And we'll start with candidate buys, please. Well, one of the things is not to increase minimum wage. That's not going to make a, a more readily available work source. And part of the problem, too, is the federal government. Uh, we really need to get the federal government acting on some form of immigration reform. Yeah, I believe that that looks like some more green card access uh, because we need to have a workforce that comes here. Uh, we also have to look at what are uh, the required benefits or the cost of government that government places on businesses when they want to hire people. Uh, we've got a lot of, peop a lot of people on unemployment. Yeah, we've got a lot of businesses that are hiring right now. I think we also need to address the education aspect of it. Right now, I think in the state of Washington, we've got about 60,000 uh, job openings in Washington State that we don't have people that are educated to take those jobs. So we need to really look at our, and especially I graduated from Bellingham Tech, so I'm a huge advocate of the community and technical college system. So make sure that we have people going into that higher education to get educated so we can fulfill those engineering jobs that are at Boeing or other uh, businesses like that. Thank you. Can Was the job regarding farm labor? Yes. I mean the question? Shortage of farm labor That's what I thought. is a big issue in our county. Did you want me to repeat the question? No, no, I just I couldn't figure out why we were going to college. But anyway, um, yes, I believe that we need to uh, resolve our immigration and uh, get our immigration laws under control. Um, I don't understand why we have to rely on Hispanic workers primarily to do our harvesting and so forth, but it seems to be that way, and I think because they're willing to do that work, and I know it's extremely hard work, that they should be fairly compensated. They all should be, should be able to unionize if they want to be unionized, and, um, and I believe that we depend on them. We depend on them for many things, not just agriculture, but many other things, and I believe that they want to be here, and we need to welcome them, and we need to find a way to, um, to allow them a path to citizenship. I don't believe they should be illegal. I don't believe in that. I believe that they should have to follow the citizenship laws just like everyone else does. And, um, but I think that we should welcome them and be, um, be happy that they're here. Thank you. Now that we know more about the dangers of GMOs to the environment and to people, would you support a measure that would require labeling of foods containing GMOs? And we'll start with candidate Mongeri, please. Absolutely. Uh, I, I think that uh, we, <laughs> it just amazes me that we haven't passed a law to label uh, GMOs because we label, on our labels, we know how much sugar is in something, we know how much fat, we know how many calories, we know how, what the vitamins and minerals are, but we don't know whether there's genetically engineered um, food in our products. I fortunately um, uh, eat organic, only organic. 
but not everybody can do that. And I think everybody has a right to know what they're putting into their bodies. And we don't know all the, all the information about how genetically modified um, foods affect us. And the United States is, uh, is behind on this. There's 64 countries in the world that have already demanded labeling or banned GMOs altogether. And the U.S. Is, is the big experiment. We're the big lab rat because they're going to find out, because of us, whether or not it harms us. And I'm not willing to take that risk. Thank you. Candidate Bice, please. So one of the big concerns with the labeling initiative that went through last year uh, was the inconsistency of its application. So, for instance, you go to a convenience store, you go into the, the cooler, you pull out a deal of Coke. That bottle of Coke would be required to be labeled. But if you were to go over to the soda fountain, pour that same deal of Coke, that was not required to be labeled. Okay? You would have some of these same inconsistencies going into the grocery store. Uh, certain aspects of, say, cornstarch, there's pretty much no GMO-free cornstarch. So you would have some corn products that would be labeled GMO-free, some that wouldn't be, or that would be labeled contains GMO. Anything basically with corn would have to be labeled GMO even if there was no GMO corn in that. And so there's a lot of consistency issues. I have a lot of concerns with labeling, but I think the best uh, solution to move forward is we know that organic is GMO free. So let's look at that. Let's move forward a positive campaign to positively label this product. Hey, I, I have a product that's GMO free. Label it as such. Thank you. The Growth Management Act became law in 1990. What is your view of how it has functioned, and what, if any, specific changes would you propose the legislature make to it? Candidate Byes, let's start with you. So I don't support the Growth Management Act as it is. Uh, I definitely think that we have to have our communities grow responsibly, yeah, and I don't think anybody would uh, be opposed to that. I believe that we should allow it more local control on that. I don't believe that the Growth Management Hearings Boards are good aspects of the Growth Management Act. And I also think we have to have a more uh, generic application where it concerns the state level implementation of regulations there. As was mentioned before, Whatcom County is very different than, uh, than Benton County or Snohomish County. And we need to take that localized approach to that. And different communities have different uh, desires on how they want to grow. Some communities don't grow at all over in the eastern Washington. Yeah, and that, so we have to have a system that's uh, that's more responsive to the, the local communities. Thank you. Candidate Monjuri, please. Um, I do support the Growth Management Act, uh, although I also agree with my opponent that I think that it should be uh, controlled more locally. Um, Whatcom County spent over a half a million dollars in the last four years fighting uh, the Growth Management Act. And not all laws are perfect, and GMA is definitely one of those. Um, but at, say, at that being said, counties must plan for growth. And we are going to be a county that really needs to plan for growth because we're going to be where everybody wants to come. Um, so I believe that we all need to plan. I believe that haphazard growth costs us um, because we have to provide uh, sewer systems and water systems and firefighters. And, um, but at the same time, it require, GMA requires us to do our homework. And I think that uh, that's a very important goal and that we should definitely um, comply with GMA. Thank you. I'm debating whether to give you one more question because things are cooking along pretty good, but it might push it over. Um, I think we're going to just go ahead and work on your closing statements. And you'll have one minute for your closing statement. And we will start with candidate Monjuri. Well, since I um, decided to delay my talking a little bit about me, I'll do that now. <laughs> I'm Joy Monjuri. And I have been a resident of Whatcom County since 1979. Um, I own a business called Field of Greens in Everson. I worked for 23 years for the Bellingham Public Works Department. And um, when I retired is when I opened my business. I've been in Everson since 1989. Um, I, my house flooded. I had four inches of water in it the first year we arrived. And I still love it and always will. I served on the Everson City Council for eight years. I was the president of the Chamber of Commerce in Everson. 
I have been on the boards of the Coalition for Healthy Communities, the Domestic Violence Commission, Leadership Whatcom. Um, probably one of my biggest passions is getting local food into our schools. I work with a program called the Farms to Schools program, and what they do is educate children about the importance of nutrition and, and um, help uh, process foods so that we can get it into the school cafeterias, and I will continue that work when I am in Olympia. Thank you. Candidate Byes, your one-minute closing statement. Well, thank you again, everybody, for being here. Thank you for suffering through six of us. Uh, I know it's been a long evening. You've received a lot of information. And I look forward to, well, I look forward to November 4th first. And it, it's <laughs> You and me both. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> but I look forward to continuing to serve you all down in Olympia. Uh, it's been a great four years. I think we've done a lot together. And it's very interesting, even the Cascadia Weekly, when they were talking about uh, our race, they really didn't have anything bad to say about me, which is a good thing. They, they said I was a uh, mirror, Im you know, kind of representative mirror image of Whatcom County and the district that I serve. And I, I take that as a compliment because I do really try to serve Whatcom County and all of its various interests. My office is always open to people to come down, and I look forward to serving you. My name is Vincent Byes, and I would appreciate your vote this year. Thank you. Please join me in, in thanking Vincent Byes and Joy Monjury for being here tonight and for running for public office. Thank you so much, candidates. Thank you to all of the candidates for being here tonight. And now Jill Bernstein will give us a few words in closing. Right behind you. Oh. <laughs> thank you, Tanya. And really, thank you to each of the candidates. Mr. Bice, we didn't suffer. We're grateful um, to you. <laughs> We're, we're actually very thankful for your presence tonight, for the information you shared with us, and for your willingness to serve. Um, it is with tremendous gratitude that the League is here tonight and that the citizens are here tonight. And um, thank you for uh, your time, your energy, your effort, and your information. Um, we'd like to also thank the members of the League who worked so hard to organize this event, and everything was put together together under the excellent leadership and auspices of Joe Collins. Thank you, Joe. <laughs> Outside of the doors, but always with us, um, is Georgia McGregor, and she is the strong hand behind the scenes in helping to organize our many volunteers, and we thank you, Georgia, as well. <clears throat> We're thankful to each of you who came tonight, to the members of the League and the members of the public who joined us in person and offered these uh, thoughtful and probing questions. We're grateful to our media partner, the Bellingham Herald, and to the City of Bellingham for their cooperation in helping to host this event. Um, we really do hope that you leave here tonight having learned more about the candidates and the issues. Uh, you can watch this again on BTV10. Uh, it will be replayed until the election, and you can find it also on the city's website. This forum will also be played between now and the election on low-power radio stations, KMRE and KAVZ, and each of these sources will be replaying um, the first two forums. If you miss the opportunity to attend them live, you can still find them. The city's website also has a link to YouTube, which has the videos there where you can watch and listen to the candidates, hear discussion of the charter review, and hear a discussion of the initiatives that are going to be on the ballots. Uh, if you enjoyed tonight's event, you may want to join the League of Women Voters, and we urge you to pick up a brochure on your way out of the building. This has membership information, or just go to our website and hit the Join Us button. We welcome all of you as members. Our most important message tonight is to remember to vote this November. Um, we have people here willing to serve us. We have to do our part, which is to... Um, uh, just get that ballot in the mail. The League of Women Voters will also be hosting an event on November 15th that will focus on mental health issues in our community. You can find detailed information about this on our website at League of Women Voters, BellinghamWatcom.org. The League is also involved in a year-long study on women's economic security that will be presented to our membership this spring at meetings that will be held on February 21st and March 21st. And you will also find information in the lobby about the League and our three plain language ballot issue summaries, uh, where they're available and how to access this information. Um, the League thanks you, the City of Bellingham thanks you, and um, 
accept our uh, gratitude and um, thank you.